We are live. Hey there, how is it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward, with another live video Q&A. And uh, the way these video chats work is I'm going to be hanging out here for the next hour, answering any questions that you would like to discuss with regards to building muscle, losing fat, getting back in shape, uh, all the mindset and strategies that go behind it. So anything that you would like to discuss with regards to your nutrition, your workouts, uh, coming up with a strategy, uh, any challenges you're dealing with, be that hitting a plateau or, or I should say getting a past a plateau. <laughs> it's usually not a challenge to hit the plateau in the first place. It's a challenge to get past the plateau. Uh, anything with regards to the mindset, scheduling your workouts, whatever, hey, throw it in there into the video chat window and I'll do my best to help you out during today's video chat. Now, before we get going, I just want to make sure that this is coming through loud and clear. It looks like it's coming through loud and clear on my end, but I want to make sure that you can hear it and see it and all that stuff from your end. So let's see. Okay, it looks like it's coming through on my end. So if you can hear me, if you can see me, type into our video chat window there and just say loud and clear, you know, say it's all good, something, something like that. Say loud and clear. Put that in the video chat and let me know. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, check coming through here. I got a couple things to organize on my end. Let's play around with the windows here. All right, let's see what we got. There we go. Loud and clear, loud and clear. Okay, good stuff. Loud and clear. Thank you very much. I always want to do that audio video check. Because if I don't, that would be the day that something would go wrong, right? I... I I normally always do that, do the check, but I remember it wasn't that long ago, maybe oh, a few weeks ago or something, I was careless, and I just said, eh, I keep doing these audio video checks every single time we start these video chats, and I just got talking, and I was on a roll. I mean, I, I had some good topics on my mind, and I was just talking and, and covering some really good stuff, and then when I checked the video chat window, People were like, I can't hear a damn thing. The microphone wasn't plugged in, so it was like seven minutes of just total silence and me just being the talking head there on the video. So that was kind of embarrassing, but at least it's coming through good. Uh, all right, so let's just jump in and see what we got. Okay, we got uh, several people. I see several regulars joining us, uh, several different some new faces I see if you are brand new to the video chat just type in new into the video chat window and let me know and another thing that you can do as well type in your main fitness goal that you're uh, trying to achieve right now so if that's building muscle put that in there if it's fat loss just put in fat loss uh, if it's something specific maybe you know you're training for a particular sport or you have something coming up, maybe a beach vacation coming up. I mean, hey, summer's here. You know, I'm sure that's a, a common thing. A lot of people want to get lean for summer. If that's in there, just put down. You want to lean out for summer. Just type into the video chat what your particular goal is for, say, like the next, the next 90 days. What is it that you would like to achieve with regards to your fitness, your nutrition, your training? What are you working towards over the next 90 days? And uh, I'll, I'll be sure to just throw in some tips and suggestions for those as well. All right, I got myself a cup of coffee. Uh, I don't drink a lot of coffee anymore. I kind of scaled back a little tiny bit. Or actually, I went through my caffeine experiment a while back where I actually took 30 days of zero caffeine. And uh, that was kind of like the reset. But now I usually have about two cups a day, one in the morning and then maybe one a little bit later so i'm having this now this is going to be like a pre-workout for me because later this evening i am going to uh, hit the gym and do a workout so this is kind of going to be like a, a pre pre-workout if you will all right let's jump into it get this show underway rc is joining us and he says lee i'm here at work and i wouldn't miss this for anything well i appreciate the support i'm glad you're here joining us but i hope you don't get in trouble at work right just kind of makes you wonder, like, what kind of quality work are we getting these days, right? I mean, <laughs> people are people are tuned into video chats while they're at work. Well, if, if your boss knew the benefits of bodybuilding, fitness, and nutrition, and how that's going to impact your, your overall energy, your state, your mood, and your productivity, I'm sure he wouldn't mind. But, uh, 
hopefully you don't get in trouble in the meantime. All right, we have Frank joining us. He says, hey, Lee, uh, thank you for the live streams. Uh, my question is, with most exercises, if maintaining proper form can higher reps for for less set, sets, I think he means, have the same results? So can doing higher reps for the less sets, for, for less sets, have the same results? Um, when it comes to this, Frank, you can... There, there's no right or wrong way to go about structuring your workouts. There, there's advantages to all the different set and rep patterns. And, and personally, I like to cycle my workouts. So, I mean, sometimes I will go through phases of uh, high reps. Sometimes I'll go through phases of moderate reps. Sometimes I'll go through phases of low reps. And, and it really depends on what it is that you're training for. Now, from a strength and power point of view, let's say like a power lifter, they're going to do their their main heavy lifts with low reps because they want to build strength, build that power, the explosiveness, and basically kind of duplicate in their training what they're going to be doing on the platform. So that would apply for a power lifter, for an Olympic lifter. Uh, if you're training for a specific sport, maybe you'll want to modify your training accordingly according to that sport. So if your sport requires more muscular endurance, let's just say a boxer, a fighter, a martial artist, someone who needs to have strength but maintain that strength for higher duration, then maybe you'll want to do more higher repetition work and more conditioning muscular endurance work to kind of duplicate the way that your body's going to be functioning in your sport. Uh, so you can change it up, and it's not necessarily right or wrong. Uh, sometimes people like to do the complete opposite as well. So maybe, for example, if... Uh, your sport was an endurance type of sport, you want to complement that with heavier lower rep training in the gym so that you get a, a more well-rounded approach. So, I mean, you can like look at every scenario and justify and, and make an argument for why this can work for the short term. The thing is, no one approach is going to work forever. Whatever set and rep pattern you take, whatever program you take, eventually it's gonna run its course. So. You may follow a particular program. In this case, you're doing a high repetition program. Like, let's just throw out one, like the 20 rep squat program. That's high reps. That's low sets. And that may work really well for you. You'll probably get some really good gains. And I know back when I followed that program, it, it stands out in my mind as one of the most productive programs that I ever followed. And if you want to see this program, just do a search for Lee Hayward 20 rep squats. I have a video on YouTube. I've got a blog post on my blog, excuse me, and um, outlining that that program. But it, it was one of the one routine in particular that really stands out as being exceptionally productive for size, strength, just just overall building muscle. But that program ran its course. I followed it for eight weeks, and at the end of eight weeks, I like peaked out. I, I couldn't make any more gains with that program, so it ran its course. And then I switched up to a more traditional bodybuilding program, you know, like three to four sets, 10 to 12 reps, that range, and basically just worked on a totally different training modality. And that's what you're going to find. So uh, I've said this before, but I'll just kind of repeat it here. Every program goes through these phases, a phase of adapt, grow, plateau, adapt, grow, plateau. And, and what happens is you start something new. Unique muscle stimulation, your body's not accustomed to it, so you have to adapt to that training. In that process of adapting, you're going to see some gains. You're going to grow. And you can ride that wave of momentum for as long as you can. Try and ride it out. So if you're making progress, you're feeling good, your motivation's high, you're seeing some results, ride that out. It might be three weeks, it might be four weeks, it might be 12 weeks, who knows? But ride it out for as long as you can. Eventually, it's going to get to the point where you're going to start to plateau. And what you'll notice is usually your strength gains start to flatline. Sometimes you may even start to lose strength. So, for example, if, if you did a certain weight for X number of reps one week, the next week you might not even be able to get the same number of reps, like in your bench press. Let's say you bench 225 for 10, and then the following week you only got 225 for 9. And then the following week maybe you know, you're know you 225 for 8, and you're like, oh, geez, what am I doing? I'm losing strength. That's just the way the body works. It's you've hit a plateau. So you need to change up the modality, probably do a deload or just change it up entirely and start that whole process all over again. 
And that right there is the fundamental principle behind the workout of the month program that we have over on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Inner Circle. So if you would like some help with your workouts and, and you're kind of confused of, you know, this guy is saying this is the best workout. No, this, this fellow over here says he's got the best workout. And you're like, I don't know what to do. Well, they're both right. They're both good workouts probably, but it's that you need to find what's going to work for you at this particular phase and what's going to be complementary to your goals. So that's the whole idea of the workout of the month program that we have because each month we lay out a brand new program that is complementary to the previous one. So for example, maybe last month we did a, a power training program to help focus on building that strength and, and muscle mass. Now the next month we may switch to some more conditioning style training, you know, in order to work on different aspects of strength. And then probably the following month, we're going to get into more of a well-rounded bodybuilding program to hit all your muscle groups in balance and proportion, maybe focus on some exercises and isolation moves that we kind of got neglected with the power training. And then you could start the whole phase all over again. So again, you just, each time we go through a training program, we're going to focus on different aspects of training so that you get, you know, over the course of time, you get a well-rounded approach and you get good, complete development. So, uh, to answer your question there, yeah, you can certainly make progress with higher reps uh, workouts, but it doesn't mean that that's going to work forever. You know, eventually it's going to run its course and you're going to need to change it up. All right. Let's see what else we have. We have Ross is joining us. Uh, our, some, um, RC is saying it's summer in New York City, 90 degrees, time to be shirtless. Yeah. When it's summertime and, you know, you're going to be hitting the beach or the pool or whatever, that's when you want to be lean. And and unfortunately, if, if you're starting right now, unless you're like within striking distance, maybe you only got like five, ten pounds to lose, you're, you've, you've kind of missed the boat for the summer because it takes time to get in shape. Ideally, getting ripped for summer should start either in the winter or in the spring. Again, depending on your level of, of your starting point, where, where you're starting from. If you only got a few pounds to lose, yeah, you can you can do that, you know, in the matter of six weeks or so. But if you got more, then it's going to take longer. But for sure, that's definitely a big goal for everybody, getting leaner for the summer. Uh, okay, let's see what else we got. Woodyolos is joining us. We have Icy Boy joining us. He says he's skinny, even though he eats a lot. What should he do to gain weight? All right, that's this is a loaded question right here because there's so many variables. Um, first off, if you're naturally skinny, you probably have an ectomorph body type, meaning that's just your natural body type. And th there's the three main body types we have. You know, you typically have an endomorph, which is someone who is naturally heavy set, you know, who kind of struggles to lose body fat, gains weight easily. You have an on the other extreme, an ectomorph, which is someone who's naturally lean, they kind of like eat whatever they want and never gain a pound. And then in the middle, you have a mesomorph, which is kind of like the best of both worlds, right? They can gain weight when they want to, they can lose weight when they want to, but you know, it's, it's not it's not the extreme of either one. Now, these are three general categories. Now, not everybody's going to fit in perfectly to, you know, endomorph, mesomorph, or ectomorph, but you can see these, these tendencies. I mean, and sometimes you might even have combinations, right? You might have someone who's lean, but they're quite muscular at the same time. And sometimes that, that's just due to years of training where they actually built up their physique to become muscular. Uh, vice versa, you might have someone who's naturally heavy set, you know, an endomorph, who through years of diet and training built their physique to resemble more of a mesomorph, but you, you will notice those general tendencies. And if you look at your own physique, you'll see, you know, you'll probably fit into one of these categories. In my own case, I'm more naturally an endomorph. I have those tendencies. If I get slack with my diet and training, I get fat very easy, right? The weight can pile on very quickly. And I, I'm constantly fighting the battle of the bulge right? Especially as I've gotten older. When I was younger, you know, it was, it was a bit different. My metabolism was faster and I found it hard to gain weight. But as I've gotten older, uh, it, you know, it's, it's kind of switched. So in your case, if you're very skinny, uh, you're probably young. You're even in your username, you're, you're, you say you're a boy. So <laughs> I'm assuming that you're probably young. One thing I want you to realize is as you get older and, and you, as your metabolism starts to slow down, you will fill out with more muscular body weight. So 
Try and, and stimulate muscle growth, but don't try and force it. Don't try and force the gains just through sheer volume of food, because sometimes that can backfire and end up making you fat in the process. And that's sometimes then you get what's known as skinny fat, where you might still have, you know, skinny arms, skinny legs, you know, you don't have a lot of muscle mass, but then you've got an accumulation of body fat, especially around the middle, just because you've been forcing so much food. So what I would recommend in your case is eat enough that you're still allowing your body to recover from your workouts. So you want to provide the nutrition you need, you know, minimum of one gram of protein per pound of body weight, adequate carbs, adequate fat so that you have the fuel there. But don't try and force your body to gain weight just through sheer volume of food. What I want you to do is instead focus on your training, focus on getting stronger in the gym, focus on your athletic performance and getting better in those areas. If you are getting stronger, if you are improving your conditioning, and you're also eating good quality nutrients, it's only inevitable that eventually your body is going to start to fill out with some lean muscular body weight. And you can actually use this to your advantage because people who are naturally skinny with those ectomorph tendencies, they tend to make slower gains, but they're better quality gains. And Sometimes, I, I think even from a bodybuilding point of view, having that characteristic can be an advantage because it might allow you to stay leaner and, and avoid having to struggle with your body fat as you get older. And, and some of the best bodybuilders have that natural uh, ectomorph body type. I mean, you know, like you see in these new categories in bodybuilding, like the physique divisions and stuff, and that really highlights people who are um, have that ectomorph tendency because that lean athletic physique where you can build muscle through training and still keep your body fat quite low without really having to struggle for it. So that's a, that's actually could, could be a, a blessing in disguise. So I don't want you to look at it as a negative, look at it as a positive down the road, because this is probably going to work for your advantage, especially as you get older and your metabolism slows down. If you can still maintain that lean physique, uh, that's really going to help. Because one of the problems you see a lot of guys do is they they go on these old school bulk up diets where they just slam down as much food as they can and just try to gain weight. And, and I've been guilty of this. I did this when I was younger. And yeah, you gain a lot of weight, but it's not quality weight. When it comes time to switch gears and then train, to fat, train for fat loss, you have to lose all that weight. And then in the process, you might even lose a lot of the muscle that you gain as well. So you're better off making slower quality gains keeping that body fat low and not having to go through the yo-yos and the ups and downs. So it'll be healthier and it'll be better for your physique in the long run as well. So in your case, uh, focus primarily on making the gains in the gym while fueling your body with quality nutrition. Don't really try and force it. Just let your body grow, not force your body to grow. We have Jesse joining us. George is joining us. Who else is joining us? Da -da -da -da. All right, let's see, George. Uh, all right, George saying, nice to, uh, nice to see you again. No, nope. thanks, George, appreciate it. Woody also saying, Lee, is, it, is time under tension better for strength or hypertrophy? Generally, it's more of a hypertrophy program, time under tension, although it can still aid with building strength as well. But uh, from a, from that point of view alone, just thinking, you know, time under tension, that's really going to help stimulate the muscle growth, but indirectly it's going to help with building strength as well. And a lot of times you'll even see this where power lifters and Olympic lifters and people like that who are primarily focused on strength, they'll do that for their big main lifts, but then in some of their assistance and special exercises that they're doing to supplement those big lifts, a lot of times they do them for higher repetitions and more time under tension in order to balance out their physique. So indirectly, it can help with strength, but directly, it, it's for building hypertrophy in the muscle. All right. Okay. Randy is joining us. Uh, Irfan is joining us from England. Okay. Patrick is joining us. Let's see what Patrick... Patrick's saying he just went a week... So far of sobriety, looking to get back in shape. Best way to detox and get more energy. All right. 
take it slow. <laughs> All right, yeah. When you're trying to get back in shape, one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of people make is they try and do too much too soon, burn themselves out, probably get injured in the process, and, and potentially set themselves back. And, and I see this a lot for, for example, like, you probably went through a phase where you were down and out, not going to the gym, and then whatever reason, the, the pain of inactivity, the pain of, you know, abusing your body got to the point where it's just got so bad that you're like, I have to change, right? What I mean, I don't know your individual situation, but I'm just kind of relating what I know from working with a lot of people over the years. Like, usually we don't change until the pain is great enough that we have to change, right? If, if, if you're just mildly uncomfortable, you're, you'll put up with a lot of shit, right? You'll put up with, you know, being out of shape. You'll put up with abusing your body and putting things into your system that you shouldn't. And, and you'll do that for so long, but eventually you're going to start to suffer some consequences from it. You know, the, the, the pain and the discomfort of, of not taking care of yourself is going to get to the point where you have to change. And when you are at that threshold, you're very motivated to change. And, and this it's good that you're motivated to make a change, but it's it's sometimes bad because people then try and over overcompensate for for years of of neglect. And you have to realize if if you've let yourself get out of shape over the course of several months, several years, or or longer, don't expect to turn it around in the matter of a few weeks. Right? It, it's not going to happen. You have to be realistic. And the problem is a lot of times people try and do too much too soon. I see this all the time. You, like New Year's is a prime example, right? The New Year's resolution crowd. They're, they're, they've been, they've let themselves go for months on end. And then all of a sudden, right, New Year's comes along and they say, that's it. I'm going to the gym. This is my year. I'm going to get in shape, blah, blah, blah. And they start working out like two hours a day, six days a week. And, you know, they go from zero to two hours a day, six days a week. And within the matter of a couple of weeks, they are totally burnt out, exhausted, painfully sore. They can't take it anymore. And then they quit. And then they probably don't work out again until next January when they get that, you know, rush of, of enthusiasm again. Start off slow when you're getting back to the gym. Like literally three workouts a week, 20, 30 minutes of workout. That's it. Like, like just purposely even start less than your than your capacity and just develop the habits get used to making this part of your lifestyle instead of trying to change everything and overhaul your life in a few weeks think of okay i'm going to take the next few weeks and just develop the habit of going to the gym i really don't care what you do when you go to the gym as long as you go right just do like a little total body circuit routine take it easy none of this training to failure and pushing the muscle no pain no gain all that crap just Go through the process and build up your work your work capacity and conditioning slowly and gradually. And then as the weeks go by, you can gradually step it up. Right? You can build up the volume, build up the intensity over time, but you need to make it a part of your lifestyle. Like It's no good to get all excited and work out for a few weeks and then quit because that puts you right back to square one. That's useless. You have to make this something that you do for the rest of your life and it has to be maintainable. So instead of thinking of it like a sprint to the finish, you're in this for a long marathon, right? You have to pace yourself so that you can make it to the end. I mean, it's just like running a marathon. It means if, if you see like a, a novice runner doing a marathon, sometimes they'll, like when the, the race starts, they'll start taking off as fast as they can and they're out in the front of the pack and they're going as hard as they can. And you know, the experienced guys are, are more towards the middle of the pack and they're just trudging along, trudging along, doing their thing. And then you, eventually what happens is the guys who are sprinting right from the start, they get exhausted, they're burned out, they can't maintain that pace. Whereas the more experienced guys, eventually they start to pass them, right? And, you know, and within the, you know, the first half of the race, the, the, the guys who tried to sprint their way to the finish, they're to the back of the pack, exhausted. They're probably walking or having to stop and take a break by that point where the more experienced guys who pace themselves, they're trudging along and doing their thing, and they're the ones who are going to be crossing the finish line before everybody else because they pace themselves. And the same applies with your workouts. You need to be able to pace yourself and be in this for the long game and not try and think of just, you know, the sprint to the finish and get, you, get yourself in shape as quick as possible because it doesn't work that way. 
All right, let's see what else we've got. Jesse is joining us. Coach Aesthetics is joining us. Uh, Coach Aesthetics is saying he wants to ask how to grow his online training business. Well, that's a loaded question. Um, send me an email and we can chat about it. My email is leeh at leehayward.com. Email me and we, we can have a discussion and chat about it. Uh, Michael DeLuca is joining us. He says he's new to the video chats and he needs to lose about 20 pounds. All right. Thanks for tuning in, Michael. Glad to have new people joining. Uh, who else we got? We got another guy, our friend saying he's trying to gain muscle naturally. He's in his mid fifties. So we got to need to lose 20 pounds. All right. Okay. Let's see what um, just going through here, just trying to see if some, a lot of these are just discussions, trying to get some questions here. Mm. Paulo is joining us. Manuel is joining us. Wants to lean up for the summer. He says he's doing intermittent fasting, sometimes doing cardio on an empty stomach. How often should I train abs? Should I do steady state cardio or hit? Um, all right, this is a good one. I actually made a video about intermittent fasting. It's I just posted it yesterday. So if you haven't already done so, go check that video out because it discusses the pros and cons of intermittent fasting. Uh, I, I do believe intermittent fasting definitely has its place for a fat loss program. I have used it myself with good success, but it's not perfect. There are some drawbacks to intermittent fasting, and I do cover that in the video. Uh, so again, if you haven't already done so, make sure to go back and check that one out. Um, but as far as your question there now of steady state versus high intensity cardio, I want you to zoom out and look at the big picture of your overall workout program. I mean, if we were just doing cardio alone, that's it. I would make the argument that high intensity cardio would be the most advantageous because you're getting the most bang for your buck for the amount of cardio that you're doing. However, most people that I work with, and I would assume probably most people who are joining in this video chat, you're not just doing cardio. You're probably doing weight training, and you're probably doing cardio, and, and maybe you're doing other sports or activities along with it. So you need to look at the overall picture of what's going on with your entire fitness routine and structure it so that things are complementary. And one of my favorite ways to structure weight training and cardio, and, and I'm going to use that as an example because that really applies to a lot of people, you know, who are trying to build muscle and burn body fat. They usually do weight training and cardio is uh, weight training is a high intensity form of exercise, right? You're doing a, a set, very short duration of, of exercise, and then you're taking these long rest breaks in between. So it's high intensity. It's you know, it, there's no steady state when it comes to weight training. So if you want a good complementary form of exercise to go along with that, low intensity, long duration cardio uh, is a good complementary way because you're already getting the high intensity interval type of training through weight training alone. So if you want a good complementary mix for burning body fat and also increasing your endurance and also to uh, as a, an act of recovery, I believe steady state is a good way to go. So what I usually recommend for, for a lot of people, and this is what I follow myself, is I refer to it as yin and yang training. So you're doing opposites. High intensity weight training one day, low intensity cardio the next. And this is a nice system that allows you to exercise on a daily basis, but it works complementary with your body's recovery. Because when you're doing that high intensity weight training, you're breaking down your muscle tissue, you're stressing your central nervous system, and it's placing a lot of stress on the body. So it's breaking things down. But then when you do the low intensity cardio, it's very complementary because it's active recovery. So it's not stressing your central nervous system. It's actually rejuvenating you. For example, like if you go out for a, for a walk, you don't feel exhausted after a walk. You actually probably feel rejuvenated because you're getting fresh air in your system and you're moving your body, but you're doing so in a gentle form of exercise that allows your body to rejuvenate itself. And it's, it's burning body fat at the same time. So, I mean, it's, it's a very good complementary form of exercise to the high intensity strength training. So that's what I do personally. I'll do weights one day, cardio the next, and do it in, any, in the yin and yang, 
high intensity alternating with low intensity. And I find that that works really well for building muscle and burning body fat. Now, with that being said, does it mean I'll never do high intensity cardio? Of course not. I mean, sometimes I will. I mean, one of my favorite forms of exercise and forms of cardio exercise that is, is mountain biking. And, you know, sometimes I like to get out there and just go for a really hard bike ride. I mean, especially if I'm feeling good, I got a lot of energy, you know, I mean, I might just hit some of the, some really intense trails uh, and, and just really go for it. You know, sometimes I'm doing a lot of hills and, and intervals that way, right? I mean, mountain biking, uh, especially if you live in a hilly area, you're getting natural intervals because, you know, obviously when you're climbing the hill, that's the high intensity. When you're on the flat or descending, that's the low intensity. So I will get interval training that way, uh, but it's primarily, it's going to be low intensity cardio for me. That like 80, 20, I'd say 80% of my cardio is going to be low intensity, steady state, alternated with the weight training workouts. But every now and then when I'm feeling a bit of high energy, full of piss and vinegar, and I really want to push myself, I will, you know, do some high intensity cardio as well, just for the challenge and the fun of it. With that being said, I usually don't recommend doing high intensity weight training and high intensity cardio on the same day. I mean, you can try it, but usually you're just kind of like burning the candle at both ends because it's just too much to recover from in, in a single go. So I usually like to space it out. Okay, let's move on, see what other questions and comments we have coming through. Uh, does, th does, sorry, does exercise improve thyroid problems? This one's from Lively Life. All right, exercise improve thyroid. Not necessarily, like if, if you have something wrong with your thyroid, maybe you're taking thyroid medication, Synthroid or, or something like that for, for your thyroid. So you're actually on hormone replacement thyroid. Um, exercise alone is not going to, to reverse that but it's gonna help. It's gonna help your body to increase its metabolism and function better. So, I mean, there, you'll definitely get a lot of benefits from exercise, but if you have a pre-existing thyroid condition, uh, exercise alone is not gonna like correct that. So chances are, if, if you're on thyroid medication, you know, you have to speak to your doctor about this because it all depends on, on the type of condition, uh, but you'll probably still have to take the thyroid medication but exercise will help to improve your metabolism, help to keep your weight under control and all that stuff that, you know, having low thyroid usually is, uh, causes those side effects, you know, weight gain and low energy and all that. So exercise can help in those situations, but it's it, indirectly, it's not going to actually change the, the thyroid hormone itself. Okay, let's see what else we have. Um, what do you feel about body composition and did you get results? I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. What do you feel about body composition and did you get results? Um, if you would like to elaborate on that question, again, this one's from Lively Life. Feel free to do so and I'll come back to it. Uh, you know, Give me an example of, of what it is that you're asking. All right, next one here. RC is joining us. He says, a bad workout done consistently is better than a great, awesome workout. Uh, I would assume not, not consistent because you didn't mention that. Uh, okay. Okay. But better than a great, awesome workout that's not done at all. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I tell you, like yesterday, I can relate to this because I, I was busy with... with with my work yesterday and I didn't get to the gym till later and I was debating whether to go to the gym because I was like man I'm just feeling exhausted I don't know if I should go but at the same time like I haven't been to the gym in a couple days I'm like I'm gonna go anyway and I wasn't feeling energetic I mean I didn't feel like pushing myself or whatever but I did a total body workout using machine exercises and I did some cardio as well so I actually followed the total body beginners workout that I have posted on my main YouTube channel. If you want to go back and check that out, it's a, just a simple exercise, ex exercise routine where you're doing one major movement pattern per each, uh, one shit, one major exercise for each movement pattern. So you're doing overhead pull and overhead press, a horizontal pull, a horizontal press, a leg press, 
uh, arm curl, arm extension, some work for the core, just one major movement pattern, one major exercise per movement pattern. And uh, I just did that for a few sets each. I mean, it was a quick, simple workout, but I felt a lot better afterwards. So yeah, I mean, a half-ass workout done consistently is better than the quote unquote perfect workout done inconsistently. Totally agree with you on that one. All right, Michael is joining us. Uh, he says, you're dead on about force feeding yourself with volume because at some point it will backfire. Okay, yeah, that's referring back to the skinny guys who are trying to force on the body weight. Yeah, it's it's it will backfire. I mean, I, very rarely have I seen someone do the, the quote-unquote dirty bulk and, and make it work. Very rare. It, it's, it's usually, it might work temporarily, but uh, more often than not, it ends up making you fatter rather than more muscular. And like I say, just gaining fat for the sake of being bigger and gaining weight on the scale, it, it's it's not going to solve your 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 fitness goals because I mean you're not going to be happy with your physique. Yeah, if I mean if you're underweight and you gain a bunch of fat, okay, you'll be heavier and you might look bigger in your clothes and whatnot, but you're not going to feel better and you're definitely not going to look better. And as you get older, that extra fat is just going to sag and and even look worse, right? You know, it doesn't get better the older you get. It usually gets worse. So trying to gain weight through sheer volume of food, and it's, it, it's, it's a backwards approach. All right, so David is joining us here, and he says, Lee, I noticed you uploaded a newish dumbbell-only leg workout a few weeks ago. Would you say that that one is better than your older leg dumbbell workout, the one with your dog, or should I do both? Um, they're... They're both good workouts. I mean, just the, the, the best workout is the one that you do. Now, there's probably some different exercises in both of those videos. I'd have to go back and review them myself. I know there's going to be some carryover, but uh, it's not a matter of one is better or worse. It's just a different workout. So, I mean, you can, you can incorporate both of them. Uh, okay, let's see what else we got. All right, Steve is joining us. He says... Uh, you creatine or protein powder. How do I know if I'm using them if it's working? I've been using creatine capsules at the recommended amount for five weeks and I don't notice any difference. All right. First off, when it comes to creatine, I would prefer using a powder. That's going to be the best bang for your buck. Creatine monohydrate powder is, I mean, that has been the most researched form of creatine, and it's it's very inexpensive. It's very readily available, and it works, right? I mean, so you can. That's what I would recommend. That's what I use personally. Just pure creatine monohydrate powder. Doesn't mean that the capsules don't work, but again, if you want to just uh, be more efficient with it, the powder would be the way to go. Um, you're saying that you don't notice any results. The way it is with creatine. It's, it's not, you're not really going to notice major results unless you have a deficiency in creatine to begin with. It's almost like if you had a vitamin deficiency, like if, if you had a vitamin deficiency and then started supplementing vitamins, you'd probably notice a big difference because you were suboptimal to begin with. And then once you got your vitamins up to the optimal levels, your body's going to feel and respond differently. Creatine is kind of the same way. A lot of people especially if you're eating a mixed diet, meaning you're eating a lot of animal protein, meat, fish, chicken, all that kind of stuff, that has small amounts of creatine in it. So if you're eating a high protein diet with animal foods and you're, you're well nourished in that sense, you're going to get a gram or two of creatine per day just from your food alone. So you may not be totally deficient in creatine. So when you start supplementing it, yeah, you can help to optimize those levels and, and bring them up to a more optimal level, but it doesn't, you may, it may not be the point where like you never had hardly any creatine in your body and, and now you do. You may have had some in there all along and now you're just really maximizing it. So you're not going to notice that big shift. Now, if you take someone who was deficient in creatine, like who wasn't eating a, a good diet, wasn't eating a lot of protein, and then all of a sudden started supplementing creatine, they're going to notice a big difference because now they went from suboptimal levels to optimal levels. And you're going to notice the change much, 
more at that stage. Same when it comes to protein. If, if you've been eating a lot of high protein foods and then you started adding a protein supplement, you're probably not going to notice a big difference uh, compared to someone who was eating a low protein diet and then started supplementing with protein. So it really depends on your starting point. That's why you'll see some people will say, well, I'm a non-responder. It's, it's not that you're not a non-responder. I mean, it's, everybody needs creatine. Everybody needs protein. We need, everybody needs vitamins and minerals and all these, you know, the foundation of nutrition. We all need it. It's not like you don't respond to it. It's just that you may have not been uh, as deficient as someone else who started taking it and then noticed a big difference. So that's why you, you'll get mixed reviews when it comes to, uh, to creatine and, and protein and, and things like that. But... Uh, the way I recommend taking creatine is take it on a maintenance amount over the long term. So me personally, I take five grams of creatine monohydrate per day, every day, just the same as I take my multivitamin every day, right? It's, it's just to keep those levels stable and consistent because once you have adequate stock of creatine in your system, uh, you're going to have the results that creatine offers, right? If you, if you let your creatine levels get depleted, then obviously you're not going to get the results. But that's probably why you haven't really noticed a, a huge difference. All right, Dazim is joining us. He says, Lee, I really like your videos and have for a long time. I uh, didn't have any questions, so I kept my mouth shut. But now I have one, and it's about leg presses. Questions in the next comment. He knows the way this works. You only have a limited number of characters per comment. So his next one is, uh, some people keep their feet on the top sides Others keep it in the middle. Why? Uh, also, some people keep their toes outside while others keep them straight. Why? Thanks for your knowledge. All right. Where you position your foot on the leg press is going to impact where the muscle stimulation happens. So I'm just going to give you a, a general overview. Uh, higher on the foot plate is going to place more of the emphasis on the hamstrings. Lower on the foot plate is probably going to place a bit more emphasis on the quadriceps. And it's just way, the way that the body is working. Uh, when you go a bit wider, it places a bit more emphasis on the inner thighs. When you go narrower, it places a little bit more emphasis on the outer thighs. So you, again, you can target different aspects of the muscle based on where you position your feet. Uh, the toes, a lot of that is personal preference. Generally, if you're going wider, you'll probably have your toes pointed out a little bit, and that's just due to the angle of your knees. Like, if if you have your feet, uh, I'm using my hands to demonstrate my feet because I can't put my feet up here and show you. But uh, the way it works is if you have your feet closer together, your toes are probably going to be more straighter. If you go a bit wider, just due to the angle of going wider, your knees are pointing out, so your toes should be pointed out. Ideally, you want to try and keep your toes in, in a relative alignment with your knees. Like it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to have a wide stance and then your toes pointed in because it's going to place a lot of jarring stress on, on the joints because they're not all in alignment. So if your knees are pointed out, then your toes should be slightly pointed out. If your knees are pointed head straight, then your toes should be pointed head straight. So try and keep your toes in alignment with your knees. Now, sometimes you may have a little bit of variance. Like maybe your toes are, are like sometimes people with a, a close stance may like to have their toes pointed out a little tiny bit. Uh, sometimes people with a wider stance may like to have their toes pointed in a little bit. But overall, try and keep your knees and your toes in alignment. And usually you can just listen to your body. Do what feels comfortable because your, your body is going to let you know if, if, if this is placing a lot of strain on the joints or feels uncomfortable. I mean, you, you pick up on this stuff. You just had to be listen to your body and be more aware of, of the sensations that you're getting. Uh, as far as what type of variation you should do, if you have knee problems, so you find that the leg press is hard on the knees or, or you just got bad knees from years of wear and tear or whatever, uh, higher on the foot plate and wider on the foot plate will generally allow you to do the exercise with less knee pain because it takes some of the stress, places it more on the hamstrings and the glutes, less on the knees. So if, if you have knee trouble, try doing your leg press that way and it probably will feel better. If you want to isolate the quads more, closer and narrow, narrower and, and lower on the foot plate is going to place more of the emphasis on the quadricep muscles. So if that's what you're doing the leg press for, you might want to do that. And it, it's okay to even switch it up. 
right? You don't have to do the same one all the time. Like even within a, a workout, like you can try doing a couple sets with your feet high and wide, do a couple sets with your feet narrow and close, um, you know, even mix it up and, and see what feels the best for you. Now, in, in my case, what I usually do is I will, I'll usually do what feels the most comfortable. So I've tried going to all these different extremes, you know, high and wide, low and narrow and, and, and all that. And, and I usually just kind of like default to somewhere in the middle because I find that works the best for overall leg development. And it's just what feels comfortable for me. So ultimately do what feels comfortable for you. But if you do want to emphasize certain aspects of your, of your legs, uh, you can play around with your foot positions to target those different areas. But again, it, it's not like one is right or wrong. It's, it's just a, a different exercise, a different way of doing it. Same with the bench press. Like for example, a, a wider grip on the bench press tends to place more of the emphasis on the chest. Narrower grip on the bench press tends to place more of the emphasis on the triceps. It's not that one is right or wrong. It's just a different variation of the exercise. So same idea with the leg press, right? It's just a different variation of the exercise and you can manipulate it based on what you want to focus on. <clears throat> All right, George is saying, I missed his question regarding forearm training. All right, I'm, if I did, I apologize. Um, he says, I need advice regarding sets and reps and time. My forearms are stubborn. I guess that was his question. Um, I tell you, the, the best thing that I would recommend for forearms, I'm just going to go back here again, make sure I'm staying on track. Your forearms are going to get a lot of stimulation just from holding on to the barbell and dumbbell handles. So some, some guys don't do any direct forearm training at all and still have big muscular forearms. I, I remember listening to an interview with Dorian Yates a while back. And he didn't do any forearm isolation work. And his forearms were massive. I mean, Mr. Olympia. Now, Dorian Yates has got really good genetics, right? Anybody who makes it to the pro level in bodybuilding, and then, of course, the elite level, Mr. Olympia, obviously has really good genetics. So what's going to work for someone at that level may not always work for someone who's less genetically gifted. But it just it's an example of showing that you don't always need to do isolation work for the forearms, just all your other exercises very often will carry over. I mean, the best thing you can do for your forearms is building up your grip. And there, there's a lot of tools you can do for this. I mean, farmer's walks with, with dumbbells, great exercise for building up the grip, uh, doing shrugs and rows and all this kind of stuff with, with your natural grip will build up your forearms. Hanging from a pull-up bar, another great exercise for your grip. Uh, there's different kinds of, uh, you know, you can pinch weight plates like for example take two weight plates probably start with maybe 10 pound plates put them together with the smooth side out and just grip and hold that for time uh, as you build up your strength you can work up to heavier weight plates excuse me guys i have a, <coughs> a burp in there and it's trying to come out <laughs> um so there's there's all kinds of different grip exercises that you can do at the gym you can also get grippers i have some right here just me a second Heavy grips, hand grippers. I carry these on my website. I have been for years. I'm a huge fan of these. And they can really help to enhance your grip strength because these come in different size and strength grippers. Uh, this one here is a heavy grips 150. Uh, they go from 100 pounds all the way up to 350 pounds in tension. So it's a great way to build up your grip strength. Uh, so anything that you can do to train your grip in a progressive overload fashion and build it up, is going to carry over into building up bigger forearms. Now, other exercises that you can do as well, like forearm isolation exercise, like wrist curls and reverse wrist curls and things like that, they do help. Uh, but I would put that lower in importance to grip training because if you build up your grip and you get stronger in the grip, your forearms are going to grow regardless if you do any wrist curls or not. But it's it's kind of like icing on the cake. So if, if you want to do... Uh, you know, the gripping work and then finish off with some wrist curls and reverse wrist curls. You can certainly do that. Uh, one tip I'm going to give you with your forearms, either do them on, on a workout by themselves or save them for the end of a regular weight training workout. Don't start with forearm training because what's going to happen is if you pre-exhaust and fatigue your grip, it's going to ruin 
all the other exercises for you because you're not going to have enough strength in your hands in order to properly perform all your other exercises. I mean, your hands are what link you with the barbells and dumbbells and machine handles and everything else. So if your grip is weak, you're, you, that's your weak link for all those exercises. You're not going to be able to exert as much force if you have a weak grip or if your grip is pre-exhausted and fatigued. So always do your regular training first and then save the forearm and grip work for afterwards. And if you would like a specific workout for this, uh, I actually have one. In fact, what I'll do is I'll type it into the chat window for you. Let me just uh, pop this open here real, real quick. It's a forearm guide that I've put together. Um, let's see where it's to if I have it there. Okay. It's called Huge Freaky Forearms, and it's a free PDF report that I wrote. And you can download it right on my website. And I'm going to give you the link to it right now in the video chat. So for those of you who are tuned in right now, just typed it in there at the end so it should be there okay yeah so you can download that forearm training guide PDF <coughs> and the link where you can go download it so hopefully that points you in the right direction George now back to our back to our video chat where was I I scrolled down to post that link now I've lost my place so here we were we're talking about George's forearms Oh, come on. Uh, what do you feel about fighting composition? What do I feel about this? Da, da, da. Okay, answered that, answered that. Um, protein, creatine, we answered that one. Uh, all right, leg presses, we got that. All right. Um, all right, where are we to? Ba, ba, ba. How many hours to exercise? That's a very vague question, but... Um, and it really depends on your fitness level and everything else, but start off small. Uh, for, for the average person, a workout doesn't need to last more than an hour. Seriously, you should be in and out of the gym. I mean, the, I'm talking about actual workout time. So, I mean, if you're factoring in your warm up and your, you know, your cool down and all that, it's probably going to take about an hour and a half. But of actual workout time, one hour is plenty. It doesn't need to be any more than that. Again, I would rather you do shorter, more frequent workouts rather than longer infrequent workouts. So again, if, if you have to ask that question, I would assume you're probably fairly new to exercise. So keep your workouts to an hour max. That's plenty. All right, Keon has joined us. He says, I don't have a big appetite and there's always days where I don't have, have it in me to eat over three times a day. Any advice? Um, well, depending on what you're training for, you may not necessarily have to eat more than three times a day, right? I mean, what matters the most is your overall calories and nutrition over the course of the day. You know, the whole idea of six meals a day, it helps if your goal is building mass because it's easier to eat more frequent meals than it is to eat more food per meal. So that's where the whole idea of six meals a day came from. Was, you know, guys who are trying to fill out their frame with, with mass, it's, it's much easier to consume a higher calorie diet that way than trying to just simply force more food in per meals. Uh, but if you don't have a big appetite, I wouldn't really force it, right? I mean, again, it depends on, on your goals and, and your situation and everything else, right? Because I'm, I'm kind of giving a, a generic answer because I don't know your specific situation. But try not to force your appetite. But what I would recommend you do is you fill up on nutrient-dense foods first. So when you're sitting down to the table for a meal, fill up on protein, fill up on vegetables, fill up on healthy fat, fill up on all those high-nutrient foods that your body needs first. And then if you have any room afterwards, that's when you can eat your filler food, you know, the, the carbohydrates, the starches, and things like that, the stuff that are lower in importance as far as nutritional value. You can eat those at the end. I don't know. I'll let, I'll let the answer machine get that. Phone's ringing. Okay. So let's see. What else we got there? Um, what other questions? 
David saying, would you recommend a jump rope routine for cardio slash weight loss in addition to strength days? I want to do maybe five minutes a day of jump rope. Sure, there's nothing wrong with doing that. You could either do it as a warm-up prior to your weight training. Uh, you could do it as a finisher at the end. Uh, jump rope is is definitely cardio, but it's it's high intensity cardio, right? I mean, like anybody who's tried jumping rope before and has done it for you know more than a few jumps, it's hard. Like there's a reason you you see like MMA fighters and boxers and that doing jump rope because it is high intensity cardio. But if you want to throw that in, if that's something you want to do, hey, by all means, you can. It's a great warm up to do at the beginning of your weight training to kind of just get your body warmed up the blood flowing and everything so you're prepared for your workout or it's a great way to do uh, it's a great thing to do at the end as a finisher okay let's see what else we got um, how to do squats properly if anything else has not worked I have a lot of video tutorials teaching you how to squat properly. Um, just do a search for Lee Hayward squat or Lee Hayward how to do squats. Uh, you know, I have, I have videos there explaining proper squat technique. There's another one that I did. It was a squat technique critique. But if you just go in and search for like Lee Hayward squat on YouTube, you should be able to find all my videos about squatting. And there's a lot of other great video tutorials about it as well. I mean, it's it's so much easier for you to go in there and actually watch those tutorials and see the exercise being done versus me just trying to talk you through it here on the video. So that's what I recommend for that. If you, if you need any exercise tutorials, just go in there. And uh, like I say, if you want to see my videos on them, just type like Lee Hayward squats, you know, or Lee Hayward how to squat. And you should find all my videos. All right, Jason's joining us. He says, have you ever used weight loss pills? If so, which ones work and which ones failed? Um, one of my favorite fat burners, and uh, that's what that's what I usually refer to them as, and most bodybuilders would probably refer to them as a fat burner versus a weight loss pill. Uh, but one of my favorite ones of all time was the ephedrine and caffeine stack. Um, this... All bodybuilders use this at one time. And in fact, a lot of bodybuilders still use it. I know here in Canada, it's still readily available. Ephedrine is, that is. Uh, in the United States, it's kind of a gray area. There were some some issues. I think it's still available, but it's probably like behind the counter at the pharmacy or something like that. I don't know. Um, oh my, something's chirping. Hopefully the camera is still coming through loud and clear. I I know one time before I had the chirp come through and I lost my video stream. So uh, <laughs> hopefully this is coming through. Hopefully it is. Uh, for those of you watching right now, is this still coming through loud and clear? Because I just sometimes when I have that weird chirp come through on the, on the computer, it means I lost my internet connection. So I just want to see, did I lose my internet connection? Can you still hear me and see me? Okay, loud and clear. Okay, good. And th this happened a few chats ago. I mean, the thing just chirped and, and beeped and I lost my internet connection. But okay, we're still there. We're still good. Okay, thumbs up. We're let, let's rock and roll. All right, we were talking about fat burners. Um, ephedrine caffeine was my favorite fat burner. I actually have a video about that. Uh, if you do a search for Lee Hayward fat, oh shit, what's it called? I'll do, I'll do a search for it. I can't remember the name of it now. Um, come on. My favorite fat burner stack or something like that. I'm, I'm going to get, I'm going to get the link for you and cause it's, it's easier. F I mean, I have a full video dedicated to it. So rather than me trying to regurgitate that. I'm just going to give you the direct link to it. Uh, right here. The Hayward Fat Burner Stack. Yeah, it is. It's my favorite fat burner supplement stack. So again, just if you search for Lee Hayward Fat Burner Stack, you should find it. And I'm going to give you the direct link to it right now. So you can check it out. Or you can check it out after the video chat if you want. Stay tuned. Stay tuned for the, for me while I'm talking. But uh, at the end, you can go back and check that one. 
There. Okay, link posted. Done. Next question. Uh, again, I got to go back to my spot again. All right. Um... Where was I? Where was I? Where was I? Okay, next one. So I, ask, I got a question here. Have I ever skipped a leg day? Of course I have. I've skipped workouts. I've skipped a week in the gym. I've, <laughs> I'm sure everybody has skipped workouts from time to time. I'm, I'm no exception. But thankfully, I'm more consistent than I am inconsistent. All right, next one. Paulo is joining us. He says, annual blood checkups, I believe, to check for cretin levels or I think can be requested. Uh, yeah, you can definitely, and that's a good thing to do. I mean, get regular blood work because it just lets you know um, where you are. I mean, for all your markers, you know, I mean, and when you go to get a checkup, it would be a good idea to actually go and request uh, all your markers so you could actually ask for your creatine levels and and the thing if you're getting blood work don't mistake creatine for creatinine it's, it, they sound similar they almost spell similar but they're two totally different things so when you ask for creatine not creatinine right that's the two totally different uh, but get you know your hormones you know your testosterone your growth hormone uh, you know your your um, Cholesterol, I mean, all, all that. Usually your doctor's going to test all the major stuff anyway, like your blood sugar and your cholesterol and all that. But, uh, you know, test testosterone and growth hormone, especially if, if you're getting a bit older, you know, you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s or beyond, uh, that's definitely a good one to get checked out. Uh, and, and usually doctors will not test that unless you specifically ask for it. Same with, with creatine. They're not going to test for that unless you specifically ask for it. So you can do that from when you do get your regular checkups. And it's good to know this stuff, right? It's good to get regular blood work just to make sure that there's no underlining root, you know, health issues that could be developing there. Okay. Ross is joining us. He says he tried to find merchandise on my website. I think it was for the T-shirts. Like, I'm wearing a T-shirt there now. I like Superman. <laughs> Lee Hayward's Total Fitness Bodybuilding. Uh, on, the, on my main blog, just go to leehayward.com. And scroll down to the bottom of the blog. It's there in the side menu bar. There's a link to my uh, t-shirt shop. It's, it's right on my main website. Just scroll down to the bottom um, and you should find it. All right, another question here. This one's from Zen60. He says he has the 100 and 150 pound hand grippers. He says they help to relieve pain and cramping in my hands. If you still sell them, I'd like to get some heavier ones. Yes, I do. Again, they're on my website, leehayward.com. When you go to the blog in the side menu bar, so right, one side is all the blog posts. The next side is some, you know, links to other things. Like you can download my app. You can download, you know, some free reports that I have there. Uh, there's also a link there to the hand grippers. There's a link there to get t-shirts all in that side menu bar. So just head over to leehayward.com and there in the side menu bar you should find links to all those stuff that you're looking for all right exercise in the morning or in the evening it really doesn't matter uh this question here it depends on what works best for your schedule and what you're going to do consistently more often than not i will exercise geez what's on the go here the computer is chirping again I'm hoping this is working. I mean, hopefully, it's not on the way out, right? I mean, the thing is just like, it's kind of, it's an older computer, but it should still work. But man, she's, she's chirping. She's chirping on me, guys. Um, yeah, more often than not, I, I usually do my exercise in the afternoon. But again, it, there's, there's advantages to both. Sometimes I find people who work out in the morning are, are sometimes more consistent and, the reason is, is because if you work out first thing in the morning, you can get it done and out of the way before you get busy with the rest of your day. And that's that's sometimes a, a problem for a lot of people. You know, they, they, they find it hard to stay consistent. So if that's an issue for you, try and get your workouts done first thing in the morning because then regardless of what comes at you, I mean, you know, you could have meetings at work, you could have to work overtime or whatever. 
it doesn't matter because you've got your workout done. Boom, it's, it's in the bank, right? You can, you, it's out of the way. Whereas if you're saving the workouts for later in the day, sometimes, you know, life can throw curveballs at you and make it harder to get to the gym. So if you are struggling with consistency, that's something you might want to try doing. Get to the gym first thing in the morning. Now, I know that's not always possible depending on your work schedule and, and everything. But if you can, uh, that would be a, a good option. But from a, from a results point of view, it, it doesn't matter. As long as you're consistent over the long term, that's what makes the most difference for actual results. Okay, let's see what else. All right. Keon saying he's at 30% body fat and he wants to cut quite high. Uh, if if you have any specific, you know, you, you'd like to plan out a strategy or something when it comes to fat loss, I'd be more than happy to chat about this with you. Because a lot of these things, it, it's not just a, like, I can throw a workout and diet plan at you. I mean, you can go on Google, you can go on YouTube. I mean, you can search for workouts and diet plans. There's no shortage of workout and diet plans out there. The problem is making that workout and diet plan fit for you, your lifestyle, and the challenges that you're dealing with, right? That's the hard part. I mean, everybody knows they need to eat less and exercise more when it comes to losing body fat, right? I mean, it's as simple as that. But where the complicated part comes in is making that actually work with your life, right? you working it around your, your schedule, your work situation, your family situation, your travel situation, you know, all this kind of stuff. I mean, that's where the problem comes in. It's not knowing what to do right we all know we should go to the gym we all know we should eat healthy i mean that that that's the, the easy part so i mean just just if i throw out oh just eat chicken rice and broccoli and work out six days a week i mean that that's not going to help anybody because you know you're not going to do it <laughs> right you need to find a plan that you're actually going to follow and is sustainable and fits with your lifestyle and your preferences i mean you, you can't force yourself to do something. It has to fit your, your lifestyle. So if you would like some help with coming up with a strategy. Jesus, I hope that computer's not going to break. <laughs> I'm going to have to reboot this thing once I finish this chat because she's she's chirping away. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a, this the surge protector is coming up. Anyway, back to my what I was talking about there. If you would like some help with planning out a strategy for yourself, uh, just send me an email, leeh at leehayward.com, and you know we can discuss your situation, your strategy, and come up with a realistic action plan that'll fit for you and your situation. Right? I mean, it's I know everybody's unique, so I mean, trying to give like a one size fits all diet or a one size fits all workout program, it rarely works. So it's usually finding a plan that's going to fit with your lifestyle is the challenging part. All right, I only got a couple more questions here, and then I'm going to clue it up. Clue it up before the computer blows up. That's the that's the plan, right? Uh, Lee, what are your thoughts on carb cycling to lose body fat? It can be a very effective strategy. It's it's more of an advanced strategy. So if if you're already following, you know, consistent with your workouts, consistent with your nutrition, and you've kind of maxed out the results that you're getting from that, carb cycling can help take it to another level, right? It's it's more of an advanced strategy. It's something that I've used myself. Uh, when getting ready for bodybuilding competitions and the advantage of carb cycling is it allows you to <laughs> the advantage of carb cycling is it allows you to uh, keep your metabolism high and actually maintain lean muscle while you're burning body fat so again it's, it's i have a sample carb cycle diets up on the total fitness bodybuilding inner circle so if you're a member there uh you can go and download them and again if, you, if you'd like to discuss uh, some sample carb cycle programs just shoot me an email we can discuss it from there okay what else uh how to you avoid bench pressing from shoulders instead of triceps and chest how, how to avoid bench pressing with the shoulders it's how you set up usually it, it, the setup of retracting your shoulder blades and expanding your chest. And I actually have a video tutorial explaining the mechanics of this. Um, do a search for Lee Hayward, how to bench press with proper technique. 
Lee Hayward, how to bench press with proper technique. And you'll find that video. It's actually one of my most popular videos. It's got over a million views and I go into detail about setting up for the bench press and, and how to uh, maximize your strength and also minimize injury in the process. All right, next, let's see. All right, Jeremiah is joining us. He says, Lee, I'm new here. Can you help me? Uh, can you tell me whether it is necessary to lift 80% of your one rep max to build muscle or is there an alternative because my joints hurt when lifting heavy? You don't need to push yourself uh, to that extreme, especially for building muscle. 80% of your one rep max is heavy. And if, if you're getting joint pain, then you, you need to do to adjust that accordingly. So I, first off, what I would recommend, scrap the whole 80% and, and just focus on doing the exercises with proper form and finding movements that you can do without causing pain or discomfort. If there is an exercise that's particularly causing pain, whatever it is, then I want you to scrap that exercise and find another movement to do instead. <sighs> I, th I think that's my cue, guys. Like, this thing is just, it beeps and beeps and beeps, and it's just like, shut me down. I'm ready to explode or something. Okay. <laughs> oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. Anyway, what was the question? Is it necessary to lift 80%? No, it's not. Your joints are painting. <laughs> All right, find exercises that you can do without aggravating your joints. That's the number one thing. And even if it's a major exercise, like if it's a bench press or a squat or, or something like that, if it's causing joint pain, don't do it. Find another variation instead. And a general rule of thumb, uh, a lot of times machine exercises are easier on the joints. Sometimes cable exercises are easier on the joints. And even using like rubber resistance bands and things like that can sometimes be easier than free weights. So... There's always a way to manipulate your exercises to make them more joint friendly so you're not placing as much strain. And the thing you need to realize is when it comes to your workouts, injury prevention is number one. If, if you can remain injury free, you can make progress over the long term. But if you get injured, you know whether that's a joint injury or a muscle tear or a pull or strain or whatever, that's what's going to set you back. So. If, if your joints are causing pain and discomfort, that's your body giving you a warning that something's not right. Something needs to be adjusted with your workouts. Maybe it's the, the exercise selection. Maybe it's the technique. Maybe it's just you're lifting too darn heavy and you need to lighten up the weight so that you're actually able to lift with the muscles rather than placing strain on the joints. But you definitely need to change things up if you are experiencing pain and discomfort because that's not normal. You shouldn't... Like, there's different types of pain. Like, good pain is that fatigue you get in the muscle after a hard workout or that burning sensation that you get when you get pumped up and like that lactic acid burn like that's good pain when you get a beep like that coming through your computer that's a bad pain <laughs> all right guys I, i'm i'm seriously getting a bit concerned for my computer here i this thing should not be beeping like it is so i'm going to like clue up this video chat uh we've had a good one i, I you know had a lot of good questions come through and we did go for over an hour, so I feel I've got my, my time punched in for the week. Uh, but I'm going to literally, like, clue this up before my freaking computer dies on me here. So there's something wrong with it. i got to get it checked out. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for your questions. I will talk to you next week. Have yourself a great one. Over and out.